All right, once again, let's try this one more time. Uh, my name is Jen. Welcome to our program, Wiggly Squiggly. Sorry about the delay. Uh, apparently, our, pro our computer thought that today was Memorial Day. Not quite. That's Monday. Uh, but thank you all for joining us. We gave our computer a talk, and now it's back in knowing that's Friday. These days, they just keep on, uh, keep on kind of blending in with one another. But we are very excited to share our program with you today to talk about some invertebrates. So animals without any sort of backbone is our theme for today. Hence, they wiggle and they may even squiggle. Uh, so with that, if you do have any questions, you're more than welcome to text them in to us today. Uh, the number is 562-286. 1838. You can see the number right down there below. If you do happen to be watching um, later on and it's not live, you're more than welcome to email us at any time at live at lbaop.org. Again, live at lbaop.org. Uh, if you do choose to text us as we are doing our program live, uh, just remember that data rates do apply and if you are a little one, please make sure that you get your parents' or your adult's permission uh, today to ask us any questions that you might have. So let's go on ahead and get started. Um, so today we are going to be talking about invertebrates, like I mentioned before. So you and I, we are actually considered vertebrates. We have a backbone in our body. And maybe some of this sounds a little bit familiar if you happen to have tuned in to our previous Wiggly Squiggly shows, either with James or with Amanda. Uh, but we all have this backbone, right? Any idea to how this backbone and bones in our body help us to survive? Hmm, what do you think? If you happen to have a guess, go on ahead and maybe tell your, your sibling if you have one, an adult near you, maybe an invisible friend, being an only child, I had that invisible friend, or two, or three. <laughs> but with that, right, go on ahead and tell them. Maybe whisper. All right, so bones. They help us do a lot of things, right? Our muscles are attached to our bones. It helps us to be able to move, make robot moves, and do lots of other fun things. Uh, our bones also provide us, you know, with stability. It helps us to be able to, to really kind of move around on land very easily. Now here at the aquarium, we are huge fans of ocean animals, as you might believe, or maybe it's a surprise. Uh, but with that, what we're going to be doing today is talking about some different animals that have that don't have that backbone or any bones in their body. So this is going to be a very exciting uh, program today. Our goal is to focus on um, some animals that of course live in the ocean, but may have relatives that also have relatives on land. So that way, maybe you can find one of those relatives in your own backyard or front yard or neighborhood today. So let's go on ahead and get started. Um, and so with that, let's go on ahead and start with one of my favorite animals, which would be crabs. So joining me in the studio today is also James. He's the one that's helping controlling the screens. And we have Dana that's going to be um, on our computer today answering or passing along some of your questions. So crabs, ah, one of my favorites, the pelagic crab. Uh, these animals are really cool. One of my favorites, mainly because a lot of times when you see them, they're up like this. Ah! And they just look very, very passionate about their, their territory. Now, these crabs right here um, are considered uh, arthropods. So arthropods is a group of animals that happens to have jointed legs, um, like you might see here oops, <laughs> with our crab. Um, and then they also happen to have a really hard exoskeleton. Now we did talk about skeleton. Ah, oh, yeah, here's a great isopod that we have right here. It's huge, but you can really see those jointed legs right there. So it's almost like if you imagine um, kind of like a, a medieval guy or gal in armor, right? Um, those folks, they have, they, if there was just one piece of metal, they'd be walking like this. And maybe many times they were. But once they had all of those different plates of armor on them, that really helped them to, to move a little bit better. And so our, our arthropods have those jointed segments or those jointed legs here. You can see there. 
All right, so with that, uh, what we have right here is a, a very typical arthropod. So they have, as I mentioned before, those jointed legs that we see here. Uh, they also have that exoskeleton. So they have hard parts on the outside, but not hard parts on the inside. It's nice and squishy inside. And so with that, um, with that hard part being on the outside, it makes it really tricky if they're animals that are trying to grow. Right? If they are a very small little crab, and then as it gets older, um, you know, it needs to be able to grow up. But how can it if it has that really hard skeleton? Hmm. Any thoughts on that? Whisper to that neighbor, that imaginary friend. <laughs> what was that? I think I may have heard it. These animals, they do something called molt. So what they end up doing is they slowly crawl out of their shell and they make an entire new one. I know, kind of wild, right? You're like, well, that entire shell is like all together. So where do they, where and how exactly do they crawl out? Great question. So here I have parts of a molt of a crab right here. And so if you imagine the little legs coming out on the sides, and maybe some pincher friends up top right here. But basically what they do is they open up through the very back, it's almost like a door from their body, the rest of the body's down here, and they would actually slowly come out of the back, all squishy, all nice and new, and then it takes anywhere between days to weeks to be able to grow a new shell on them. So, oh, looks like Stewie has, uh, James has a molting video for us. So let's go on ahead and see if we can see that molting video in, in action. It's really cool. Now, this original 40, it, video is 40 minutes long. So this is like really speeding it up. So you can see this crab right here. Um, what we have is the front of the crab right over here. And then we have the back of the crab. So this is all of the freshly molted crab. And you can see it slowly kind of scooching its way out from behind. It's really cool to be able to see this video. All right, so it's slowly moving. And remember, this is over 40 minutes, so it's super sped up. Now, during these times in which these crabs have these very soft bodies, they lose that armor. And so these animals have to go on ahead and maybe hide in a spot to be able to protect themselves the best they can before they are actually able to venture out, you know, nice and solid back into the world right there. But if you go on ahead and notice, you may see those eyes, those eye stalks, right? They're still there. The, all of the antenna are still there too. And you can see all these legs just freshly molted right there. So you can see too that they're very different kind of colors, right? This one's really bright. And this one's a little darker right there with all that algae and growth coming on up. Now, as we continue to watch this crab mole, it looks like we do have some questions that are coming in. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, let's see. So Jenna asked a, a few questions. We're going to start with, do other animals use the molted shells? That is a fantastic question as we just are talking currently about molts. And as a matter of fact, uh, different animals will use those molts. Uh, many times, some of the animals that have recently molted will consume some, will actually eat some of that, that of some of that shell. That helps them get that calcium that they need to really build that, that old shell or that new shell on top of them or that exoskeleton, um, as mentioned. There are um, other animals that will use the, the minerals that are slowly... Um, that are slowly being eroded away or weathered away from that shell, that shell will eventually turn back into calcium and that calcium can then be used for, for a wide variety of animals. But to my knowledge, um, unless either one of you have any other additional animals that they can think of off top of their heads, uh, mainly those that have molted are the ones that are usually going to benefit from the rest of their exoskeleton right there. All right. So, uh, aside from that, another question are what do crabs eat? Oh man, that's a great question. We have yet to get into what exactly they eat. Um, and so if we go on ahead and we think about a lot of these animals and we look at them, hmm, let's see if we could take notice. 
looks like they're on the ground. So they probably don't eat, you know, they probably don't like swim and catch anything up in the air. They have really small mouth parts that they use. They do have those large claws. So any thoughts to what you think they might eat? Hmm. If you're thinking that they're a scavenger, you are absolutely right. These animals can scavenge. So they'll go on the very bottom of the floor, find a crab, right? They'll go on ahead. They might pick at a dead fish. Yum, 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 yum. Mmm, fermented food, right? They'll go on ahead and they love to eat a lot of dead or decomposing animals. But that's not all. Sometimes they'll go on ahead and eat other animals too. They can be very opportunistic feeders. So, you know, other animals that might be within their area. Maybe it happens to be a snail. Maybe it happens to be another crab. Ah, oh, yeah, that's, the, that's my favorite crab pose. You can do it with me, right? And so these crabs uh, do eat a wide variety of food. It just kind of depends on the particular crab species. But what is really cool is you can see that they do have those really tiny mouth parts, right? And so those tiny mouth parts really help them to be able to kind of shred a lot of that material as they bring it into their mouth. Now, some of them um, might eat plankton as well. So they might just filter the water through and they might be able to eat that way. So there's a lot of different variations and all different foods that crabs eat. So thank you for asking that question, Jenna. Um, and then let's see. Ah, are inverts or are invertebrates or vertebrates more successful in the ocean? Uh, I think it might depend on how you, you define successful. Are they happy and fulfilled with their lives? They very well might be successful. Uh, but for them, I think, you know, they are, I would say that every animal has their own particular um, niche or their own particular place that they have in the animal world and animal society. And so that helps them to be able to be successful in the environment that they live in. So, but great question. I like how you're thinking about, is it, is it more or less successful? Um, but I do know, I think on land and in ocean, arthropods are the most dominant um, grouping or phylum that, that we have here on the planet, right? I think so. Um, if not, let me know, but fairly certain that that's the case, right? And so if you think about the variety of animals that there are, the diversity, um, then arthropods are, at least for the invertebrate variety, the, the most popular. Um, but we have been talking a lot about arthropods. Uh, and with these, do crabs, I've got another question about whether or not crabs travel in packs or alone. And so that's a really interesting question, right? I think it kind of depends on the crab, uh, which I feel like is a usual kind of answer, right? Uh, but it also depends on their type of personality. So some crabs will actually live together and will be in a large population kind of roaming around. There are some land crabs that are like that. Um, and there are some ocean crabs, like the Dungeness crabs. A lot of them will come up onto the beach, uh, females mainly, to kind of, to kind of molt. Um, and so what we kind of call that, if I'm not mistaken, is like a catastrophic molt, where all of the, most, a lot of the females in the local area will come up to the beaches or they'll molt near the, the water and a lot of their molts will come up onto the shore. So there might be times in which crabs can, you know, group and, and, go along, move along together as a herd. But there's other times where crabs just really like their independence in their own territory. As you can see here, right, our image, this crab is like, rah, this spot is mine. I am the owner of this area. And so it really depends on that crab. Thank you so very much, Nicholas, for, for asking. Um, and in regards to when they molt, it really depends too uh, on the season. So many times I think they molt in summer, but they can molt during other times of the year as well just depends on the crab and, um, you know, sometimes it's all about the reason why they molt. Obviously, as I mentioned before, they might want to grow in size, um, but some of them also molt every year, usually every year, um, or every few years, if they want to reproduce. So sometimes it makes it a little bit easier for them to reproduce when they're not full of armor. Uh, when they're much younger, like wee tiny bitty crabs uh, slowly growing up, they tend to molt more frequently. So they will molt several times a year. And if you think about it, it's kind of like us, right? As we get older and we start from being very small and then getting older, we grow a lot faster when we're younger, right? Like we need more pairs of shoes because our feet are too small and we have to 
you know, move up several sizes really quickly. Versus now, I don't find myself needing new shoes to, to grow, my feet don't grow. I may grow a little wider, but I definitely don't grow very much taller. Uh, so it really kind of depends on, on the particular animal and where it is in its life stage. All right, and Jackson and Eric, thank you for joining us today. How do invertebrates breathe? Hmm, that's a good question. Let's think about this for a little bit. What do, what do fish use to be able to breathe? Any thoughts on that? Hmm. They definitely don't have lungs like we do. Let's look at a fish here for inspiration. Ah, they have gills. Yes, you may have said it at home. Gills are correct, right? So they have gills and invertebrates, depending on the variety, some of them will have gills too. Like for our crabs, they will have little gills inside them to help them breathe. Now, other animals uh, may not have those gills, right? So like for instance, uh, jellies are, or jellyfish are another really good example of an invertebrate and they don't have those gills that you might see here like on our fish. So I think it varies depending upon the type of creature. Uh, one creature though, that has a really cool way of breathing and it actually uses, oh, what's it called? totally blanky, respiratory trees is what it's called, are the sea cucumbers. And so sea cucumbers are related to sea stars. Um, and these sea cucumbers actually open and close their anus. Yes, their butt. And as they open and close, the water comes in and out and the respiratory trees, which are almost like little gills, they go on ahead and are able to really bring in that fresh water and oxygenate or help that sea cucumber breathe. A little different than a land cucumber, mind you. Uh, but let's see if James can kind of pull up a sea cucumber um, on our screen. They're not the, the usual animal that we talk about here. But if you have joined us for other Wiggly Squiggly programs um, or other programs talking about sea stars, um, they, they breathe kind of, they are related to those sea stars. So if you have seen our shows before, what are some general characteristics of sea stars? Hmm. Yep, they have that kind of symmetry, right? So they have that circle symmetry. Ah, here's a great picture of a sea cucumber right here. So if you basically would go on ahead and think about sea stars, sea stars, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers, all of these are considered echinoderms, meaning spiny skinned. Um, and with these spiny skinned creatures that we have right here, they share some things in common too. Much like our arthropods that have those exoskeletons and the jointed legs and appendages, our, um, our echinoderm here has that spiny skin and they have radial symmetry or five part symmetry. Um, so basically, that looks all the same. And now it's tricky because like with a sea star, you're like, okay, I understand how maybe I can like cut up a sea star, kind of like a pizza and be able to see how it all looks the same, right? But for this cucumber, one, it doesn't even look like a cucumber. And two, how could you do that with a cucumber? Well, if you took the cucumber, right now it's on the side, right? So it's very almost like sausage-like. But if you turned that and you looked at it directly on its face, which its lovable face is about right here, uh, you may notice that it actually looks the same on all around, on all the sides. And so they also have those tube feet, which you can see right here, that help them to be able to do very similar things to what a sea star's tube feet can do right there, right? What do you think they might do? Definitely helps them to walk, right? They may even, help them to stick to things too. Now, if you're wondering what sea cucumbers might eat, uh, they actually eat sand and they will poop out clean sand. And going back to the exoskeleton, all that calcium, if that happens to just break down and dissolve, the sea cucumber here will actually go on ahead and as it eats that sand and maybe eats those little pieces of exoskeleton, it will kind of like poop out basically a lot of clean sand like earthworms do on land, but it'll also kind of help dissolve and break down that, that calcium too so that other animals can use it. So these sea cucumbers are very cool. Now it looks like we have a few questions. Sarah asked, how do crabs protect themselves? Oh man, let's see if we can maybe 
recall general things that make up our crab, a crab, or a crab and arthropod. Hmm. Well, aside from it looking kind of mean, like, hey, it goes on ahead and it has that exoskeleton, right? That hard shell on the outside. So not only does the exoskeleton provide our animals that are gooey on the inside, right? That nice hard structure that it needs to be able to move around, but it also helps our crab to really be able to protect itself from a lot of different predators, right? And if you notice too, our crab had really big pinchers. And so those pinchers can also help them to protect themselves from other animals too. Great question. Thanks for asking, Sarah. Uh, Riley asks, where are the crab's eyes? Oh man, right? It can be really tricky to see. Now in our, I think this is a sheep crab, um, we have an eyeball that's around here. And then we have one that's right around here. And so those are the eyes on the crab. And so as you can see up here, let's see, work on my pointing today. We have our eyeball right there and then our eyeball right there. Now, as I mentioned, there's some of these that you can actually look on land. And you're like, wait, Jen, land crabs? They do exist in certain parts of the world. Now, may not, there may not be too many in your local neighborhood, but there definitely are some other arthropods that are on land that are related to our crabs. Can you think of any? Kind of tricky, right? Hmm. Let's see. Roly polies. That's one example. So I invite you today to be able to see if you can find a roly poly. It's actually very similar to our friend right here. If you're not familiar with a roly poly, maybe in your neighborhood you might call them pill bugs um, or sow, sow, sow bugs. Uh, so those are some different ways that, you know, you might recognize a pill bug or a roly poly as I've always known it. Uh, so they look very similar to our friend right here, just much smaller. They're not going to be really massive. So that would be very interesting if we saw a really huge one just go through the neighborhood, because that's how they would walk. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and answer our one last question, as unfortunately we are running out of time. Angela is asking a question about octopus, which is another great wiggly, squiggly invertebrate friend. Uh, why do octopus have bags on the back of their head? Yeah, it really does look like bags on the back of their head, doesn't it? Well, an octopus, if you look at it right here, we're kind of looking at the, I don't know, like the front parts of our octopus. So let's see if we can try to figure out what we're seeing right here. Looks like we have some arms um, of our octopus. There are hopefully are about eight-ish of them on our octopus. Looks like we are seeing some suction cups that may help them to move, stick, and taste. So interesting. I think I see some eyes, an eye right here and another eye right there. But we're still kind of missing a lot of other parts, right? If I think about myself, I have eyes. I'm, I have arms, two of them, but I have arms. I don't have any suction cups. That'd be kind of cool though if I did. Be almost like octopus woman. <laughs> kind of has a good ring to it. Uh, but aside from that, if we look at the, the bag that's kind of right here, that's actually the rest of its body. So it holds all of, the, all of the other organs that it uses to be able to survive. Now, it does have its, its head, which is right here. So it still has its brain that's kind of up here. Um, but the rest of, of everything else of the organs would actually be held in the back there. So these octopus are called, actually called cephalopods. Uh, cephala meaning head. And then pod meeting foot. Well, I'm pretending these are feet, uh, like little kitty paws. But basically, not that kitties, cats are actual arthropods, but uh, they have those legs and they are head. So head footed. Um, and so that head and that bag actually holds all the rest of the organs. And then you have all the feet or the arms up front. So thank you, Angela, for asking. And thank you all for joining us today. It's been absolutely wonderful spending uh, this past half hour-ish with you all. Uh, if you do have any further questions, remember you are always more than welcome to send them on in to live at lbaop.org. Again, that's live at lbaop.org. We have a really awesome class that's gonna be coming up uh, later on today. 
It's going to be called Crafty Critters. So if you're interested in learning about maybe how art and science combine, and maybe you want to craft a critter today, you, more, you are more than welcome to. We have other programs that are also happening today where we're talking about food webs um, and even an Ask a Scientist where we're going to be talking about sharks today too. So a lot of fun, different adventures. Looking forward to seeing you all for the rest of the day. Thanks for joining us and take care. Bye.